We'll go look. It's, it is it is recorded for future prosperity. So just in case people want to talk about being bad, I will say good evening and welcome to the April 20th, 2016 Capital Improvement Program and Finance Audit and Budget Committee meeting of Prince George County Board of Education. If, if, if those of us in this room, if any of you, if I hear phone ringing in this group, we got problems. <laughs> yeah, right, see, there you go. Right. All right, Ms. Wilson, please theoretically in your brain call the roll, but you don't have to actually call the roll. Just note who's here. Okay. The roll has been called, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Did you mark me here? <laughs> um, and the agenda items for the CIP and FAB committee meetings are listed. If there are no questions, we can get started. The questions? Good to go? All right, I will yield the floor to Dr. Maxwell and the administration for an overview of the CIP discussion item 3.1. Thank you, Dr. Eubanks, members of the board. Mr. Rupert McCabe and members of his team will give you a brief 15 or 20 minute overview of the, of the uh, Educational Facilities Master Plan. Thank you, Dr. Maxwell. Um, good evening, uh, board chair, vice chair, Dr. Maxwell, board members, and other staff. This evening, our staff will present the FY17 Preliminary Educational Facilities Master Plan for your review and information, which will also be presented to the board on April 28th at three community meetings in April and May, and finally to the board on May 12th for approval. I am Rupert McCabe, CIP Officer for the Board of Education. With me this evening is Elizabeth Chason, Planner, and Lucian Mushawir, uh, fiscal analysts. Okay, thank you. Um, one year ago, um, we asked ourselves um, and a group of consultants that uh, we commissioned some basic essential questions um, for district inventory. And the three basic questions that we asked as a collective team, um, number one was, what will it take to bring every Prince George's County Public School into a state of good repair? The second major question was, what will it take to align each facility to support 20 boys? 21st century education. And the third underlying question we asked also was, how do we establish a transparent plan of action that will elicit the support of the public and the confidence of our biggest supporters? Now, the uh, following slides um, that follow, uh, Lucian will now explain um, these findings. Thank you, Rupert. Good evening, everyone. Launching 20 years of capital improvement, this year we vetted the findings and the recommendations from the 2015 Master Plan Support Project with um, Prince George's County Public School staff and the community. What you see in front of you is the best effort to finalize these recommendations and to show the policies, data, and rationale to support them. Plus, it will contain a school-by-school -school schedule to include modernizing schools, constructing new schools, grade reorganizations, boundary changes, and planning studies to consider consolidation. Stakeholders' input, which is a very important part of the process. Stakeholders' input is important to the development 
of the annual educational facilities master plans. There are three points we want to make here. The facility advisory committee meets monthly and is comprised of academic leadership, pupil accounting, building services, and other Prince George's County public schools staff. There are 13 Prince George's County Public School instructional directors. The capital program met two times with the instructional director, first in the summer of 2015 and this past winter to review specific recommendations for the school instructional directors oversee. And third, community meetings. The capital program hosted three separate meetings with the public in the spring of 2015 to review initial recommendation of the master plan support project. We attended community meetings upon request from summer of 2015 through now. We also co-hosted with Pupil County the three community boundary meetings in December of 2015. And three more community meetings will take place in the next two weeks. The next one will be April 27, May 3rd, May 5th. All of these will be, of course, prior to the board's May 12th meeting, which will be our scheduled time for the approval of the Educational Facilities Master Plan. And now my colleague, um, Ms. Elizabeth Chasen, will present the next set of slides. Thank you. Good evening. Elizabeth Chason, and um, this part of the presentation is what's in the Educational Facility Master Plan. So each EFMP, Educational Facility Master Plan, has to include the state required elements that assist in justifying the plan's implementation and future requests for state and local funding in the Capital Improvement Program, or CIP. So we're going to overview each of these five sections in the next few slides. If I can get this to change, right? Oh, I got it, all right. So, so it starts with the goals, policies, and guidelines in section one. Um, the, there are about five guidelines right now. Um, many of the tables show the degree to which we currently meet these guidelines. Uh, some examples are the list of the number of small schools that are under the optimal size guidelines, the number of elementary schools remaining to be re reorganized to pre-K through five. Right now they might be pre-K through six. The number of schools that are over and under the optimal utilization guidelines, which have been established at between 80 and 95 percent of state rated capacity. So these guidelines later translate into plans in sections three and four that will support our capital needs in the coming years. So we have a lot more specific details on these policies and guidelines in section one. In section two, we look at and we analyze the community. Um, for the whole of Prince George's County because we recognize that community dem demographics and trends influence the size and number of schools needed in each geographic area of the county. Um, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission or MNC PPC provides PGCPS with data on overall county statistics and trends. Um, this is primarily coming from Plan 2035 which is the recently updated Prince George's County 20 year master plan. It has the projected growth um, and the next 20 years of community needs in that plan. Uh, more details on that are in Appendix D of the Educational Facility Master Plan. Then the P Pupil Accounting and School Boundaries Division of Prince George's County Public Schools that coordinate enrollment and staffing needs for various academic programs. An example of this would be in two different elementary schools with the same number of classrooms and square footage. They might have very different state rated capacities. This might be due to special education services such as an autism program that has fewer students per classroom which would lower the overall capacity of a facility even though it has the same number of classrooms as the school next door. Uh, career and technology classes at <coughs> excuse me, high schools uh, or career, uh, creative and performing arts 
um, programs. They require more square footage per classroom and also have fewer students per class. This would reduce the capacity and number of classrooms at two schools that actually have the same exact square footage, right? Um, then we look at transportation demands, working with our transportation office and supporting services to analyze the distance to a school and how many students need to be transported. Uh, PGCPS buses, more than 63% of our students are almost 83,000 students to schools on yellow school buses. Uh, this affects long-term operating costs and creates the need to provide larger bus drop-off and parking areas at schools with high percentages of bus students. So this, of course, affects the capital program again. Um, housing trends are also important. We review plans for new housing developments and calculate the expected pupil yield for developments or the number of students projected per household in these developments. Um, for instance, the average yield is less than only one student per five homes. So in a development with 2,200 homes, you might have only three to four students per grade. This might not be enough to justify a new classroom addition at the nearest school. That all depends on the utilization of the school. So all of this is analyzed in the community analysis section of section two. Oops. Um, so enrollment trends are also looked at by pupil accounting and school boundaries. They annually project enrollment for the next seven years. Uh, the county has been divided into six public use micro data data areas, or PUMAs, they're referred to as. Uh, over the last 10 years, while there's been a precipitous drop in the southern part of the county in enrollment, this looks like it may have stabilized in the last three years since 2013. So from 2011 to 2015, the school age population stabilized across the county, and it looks like it's rising overall. And you can see that that's the black line in the middle of the graph. It remains steady in central area, or that's the orange area five, and it has risen since 2008 in the north, particularly in areas one and two, which are the darker green areas. You want, you want to go back? Okay. I'm sorry, my glasses. Is that area seven, is that 5,000 or 6,000? Um, area seven is 5,000, 126. Thank you. Um, so in section three, we then start to um, evaluate our current inventory of facilities. Uh, the 2015 master plan support project consultants um, evaluated all but the newest schools for their ability to support the um, program, educational programs and mission of the Prince George's County Public Schools. This is referred to as the Educational Adequacy Assessment or EA Assessment. Um, this is on a scale of 1 to 25, and the scores range uh, between 10 to 19, so kind of in the middle. Uh, most schools scored 14 to 15, and there need uh, renovations to address deficiencies in building and room layout. And this might be just borderline sound, light, temperature, and technology performance. The lowest scores reflect higher needs. However, many of these lower scores were related to overcrowding of a school and the need for additional space. So schools that receive boundary and program changes will have their educational adequacy scores reevaluated in the coming years. Then we have um, um, a section on the condition of all of the facilities. Um, from last year, you may remember that the master plan uh, support project consultants also weighted the, um, up and updated the Parsons 2012 Facility Condition Index scores. So they're now WFCI priority scores. And the focus is on critical building systems affecting health and safety issues, primarily giving added attention to the need for new heating and cooling systems that are past their life expectancy. And that's gonna be the differences in those scores from what you've seen in the past. Elementary school and middle schools generally have lower scores than high schools, indicating poor condition and higher need and the details on the methodology and findings can be found in section three of the educational facility master plan. Elementary and middle schools had, you said poor? They tended poor. to score lower than the, high schools. than the high schools. So we've spent a little less on them over time. Then there was a utilization assessment. Um, the consultants reassessed the use and capacity of every school or their state rated capacity. 
Um, they re recommended revising this for many schools based on the board approved educational specification prototypes for elementary, middle, and high schools that were approved last year. So they aligned them to see how far off they were on base. Generally, schools in the north were overutilized. Um, pupil accounting projects a shortfall of over 5,500 seats in the elementary, middle school, and high schools by 2020. Elementary schools in the central and southern areas were underutilized with a projected surplus of 4,500 in the south and 3,500 in the central area. One sixth graders are moved to middle schools, so that's not current, that's after all of the remaining sixth graders are moved. So most middle schools in the southern area are underutilized, however, both central and southern area middle schools will need additions in order to be at optimal capacity with the movement of all of the sixth graders to middle schools. Even with projected new housing, high schools in the southern area are and will continue to be underutilized with a protect, projected surplus of almost 2,800, and this is after the consolidation of Forestville High School. So maps for each of these school types are in section one. Um, so now Rupert's going to take over. Oh, thanks, Beth. Um, the next two slides deals with the, the funding summary and the funding needs for the next 20 years. Um, the goal of the Education Facilities Master Plan The goal of the Education Facilities Master Plan is to transform our inventory such that all schools would be in a state of good repair. Uh, with educationally appropriate facilities that are well utilized. This will be achieved through nine planning studies that are recommended. Um, these planning studies would look at utilization, enrollment, educational programs, conditions, as indicated in the MPSP analysis. We are taking a balanced approach um, so that projects would include full modernizations, renovations, replacements, new schools, additions, or a combination of the above, and uh, including systemic replacements, which we have to cont continually maintain for the life of the facilities. Um, currently, this, the pie chart on your left, you'll see where we have 30%, 31% um, of, of our neighborhood schools that are overutilized, and 50% uh, are underutilized. The plan is, after the approach we take, with the funding in place, for the 20-year plan, $8.5 billion, um, we believe that, um, and our hope is to have utilization at about 100% as, as best case scenario. The overall 20-year uh, plan um, from the MPSP is very significant, as you recall, the $8.5 billion. And um, it's divided into three cycles, cycle one, two, and cycle three. And um, while cycle one focuses on $3 billion and, um, for estimated 32 projects and um, focus on overutilization and condition of facilities. And just to remind you, um, cycle one is included in the current FY17 to FY22 CIP. That request is about $2.5 billion, just to, let, just to remind you where we are. And then cycle two and will focus on conditions and um, cycle three on a complete of all the, the facilities and the plan areas in the recommendations. And, um, and we hope this would um, give us uh, our objective. Um, and the last note I want to make on this slide, um, FY17 alone, the funding request is over $300 million to commence this initiative. And uh, Beth Chason will continue on the other slides. So this slide is a, a kind of overview or summary of the cycle one projects um, in FY17 through 22 in the, mass, in the uh, capital improvement program. There are of all major renovations and replacement projects for existing schools. There are no new schools on this table. Um, okay. And in the Educational Facility Master Plan, you'll see that there are actually four of these, Cycle 1, Cycle 2, Cycle 3, Cycle 4, so you can see all of the schools in the system. Cycle 4 is actually all of the new schools that haven't been analyzed yet. So, um, 
So planning recommendations for addressing underutilization over the next six years, um, we're considering nine planning studies to look at boundary changes, educational program changes, and consolidations. Um, just to note, the master plan support project recommended bigger additions at existing schools with 29 consolidations over an 18-year period. What we did so far, you can see at the bottom of the screen, is that we consolidated Thomas Claggett and Kenmore Elementary School in 2015 while they were doing their study. And then this year, we're doing Forestville High School and Skyline Elementary School. Um, so the staff has recommended up to 10 more consolidations over an 18-year period with smaller additions at existing schools, therefore fewer closures than the consultant had actually recommended to begin with. And that would be through 2035. So over the next six years, we have all of the Cycle 1 projects listed um, that are in the CIP, so we plan to add additional high school capacity to deal, address overutilization in the overcrowded Adelphi Langley Park area. We have one new 400 student international high school at Langley Park and one new 1700 student high school, somewhere between High Point and Northwestern high schools, and the site hasn't been identified yet. And then we're adding middle school capacity to prepare to move sixth grade students from the elementary schools to middle schools. Um, that means two new 1,200 student middle schools, one in the Delphi area and one in the Glen Ridge area. And we have seven middle school renovations and additions to increase capacity across the county. Um, and the capacity would rise to about 1,000 to 1,200 students in all of these middle schools. Um, the schools are William Wirt, Kenmore Middle, Drew Freeman, Thomas Johnson, Charles Carroll, Walker Mill, and Hyattsville Middle. And then at the elementary school level, we show that we're overcrowded basically in the northwestern area again, and we need one new 675 student elementary school in the Adelphi area, and four elementary school renovations and additions to increased capacity at Hyattsville Elementary, Spring Hill Lake, and Riverdale Elementary schools. James Duckworth is on this list as well, and it's actually a conversion of an existing special education regional center into a comprehensive elementary school to increase capacity in the Calverton Beltsville area. So this is a recap, um, not in chart form, <laughs> just a list of schools alphabetically, um, not in priority order of the 27 school modernizations and replacement projects over um, in cycle one, and, and also the one environmental instructional campus, William Schmidt Outdoor Education Center, and the five new schools. In section five, section five is, I think, 170 pages long because this is the details of the plan. Um, it has the school by school schedule for each planning area, planning areas one through 40. Um, you may remember that these 40 planning areas were established um, last year during the master plan support project. And um, we divided the county into three major areas, north, central, and south. There's an alphabetical listing of all of the schools so that they can be more easily found at the beginning of section four and at section five. Um, also, to find your school, you could type the name of the school in the, electric, um, in the electronic copy of the PDF using uh, control F, and it will actually highlight everywhere in the document that your school appears. So I have to figure out how to kind of post that on the website for people. Um, and, and so generally, you know, there are elementary schools 1 through 15 are in the north and 16 through and so on and so forth. So you can see how they're broken down to the long list. And then each planning area has three tables and then there's actually a planning area review guide to help with the details of why it's, how, how to read the data. And um, so table A has the weighted facility condition index scores for all of the schools within that planning area. It also has the educational adequacy priority scores. Um, 
Table B is the enrollment projections for the next seven years to 2021, and we would have to update this annually. Uh, it shows the space available or needed at each school. And Table C shows the future capacity and start date for all of the recommended capital projects. Again, as the projections change, um, the capacity will have to be adjusted and the start date may have to be changed slightly as we move forward. And Rupert? Uh, thanks, Beth. Um, so the education facilities master plan in these, tr these strategic plan, a couple of things that um, just to make sure, just to make a note um, for reference. It's, um, it's aligned with the county master plan 2035, um, number one, as well as to our bridge to excellence uh, plan, mission and goals, uh, point number two. And um, as the EFMP is a 20 year plan that will adapt existing facilities to the physical changes needed to excel academic, academically, and we deliver the promise of Prince George's County Public Schools. So everything is aligned in alignment of what the district wants to do moving forward in the next 20 years. Um, in closing, um, the next slide talks about where we are today and the next steps. And um, this evening, we present to you um, an overview of the Educational Facilities Master Plan and um, for your review and, and um, you know, and, and, uh, re and, and research. Um, the next couple of meetings we have in the um, uh, 4th April 27th is our first community meeting at Northwestern High School. And um, in that meeting, we will also have uh, a brief presentation recap of the middle schools that, um, that, that was presented at the public hearings uh, previously in early April and um, so that um, we can have more feedback from the community. So that's a, another presentation we'll do by architects and by, by our staff. And um, on April 28th, we have the board meeting here as a first reader. And then um, the other community meetings, May the 3rd at Oxen Hill, May the 5th at Charles uh, Flowers, and then May the 12th back at the board meeting here for final approval. And so just to let you know what we have been doing with these meetings, we have been teaming up and col collaborating with um, our communications office. And um, to date, we have sent out almost um, through communications over 70,000 um, sub to subscribers through the, um, the gov.delivery method. So they get in the information from lessons learned. They've also made a banner on the web page that links to the flyers that also went to the principals for printing out. So the schools, the principals have the flyers. They're doing the robocalls. But they haven't scheduled that time yet, but that will be done also, the robocalls. And, um, and then this week, I think by Friday, for what I, I learned at that, um, in the newsletter, the community newsletters that will be going out this week, kind of, kind of give the community a, a heads up of what's taking place. And then later on in April for the May meetings, the last two meetings below, um, we'll have a second mass message through communication to let the community know of um, these community meetings that are coming. So basically, this is uh, where we are today to include our next steps, and uh, this ends our presentation. And um, information updates available at www.pgcps.org, CIP, for any additional information that you may need. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Well, let me turn lights up, and I will open up the floor to my colleagues for questions and or comments. Mr. Wallace. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and great presentation. I do have a few questions. Uh, as folks know, the two consolidations that happened this school year were both in District 7, so uh, bear with me as I, I do have a couple. On page four. Slide four. Uh, slide four, slide I'm four. sorry, slide four. Um, the first question, dealing with the Facility Advisory Committee, uh, the meetings, are they open to the public? No, they are not. They're staff level meetings. All right, thank you. And then under community meetings, the first bullet, the three community meetings for the MPSP in, in the spring of 2015, 
just roughly, what was the attendance like at those three meetings? Um, it varied. Um, I have that written down somewhere else. Just but a, I think just there, there are maybe up to 50, 70 at one meeting, mm -hmm. and then only 15 to 20 at another. So gotcha. it's, it, it varies. Okay. And but then, we, do, we do hold them north, central, south, and regardless of how many people come. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank so. you. Uh, and then the third bullet, upon request for the five community meetings, um, which community meetings did this, this group attend? Um, were they, they civic they associations? They were public or? meetings. Mm -hmm. So um, one of them was at Fairwood. Another one was a district meeting. We have them written down if you'd like the list. Okay. I'll but, follow up. Yeah. I'll follow up. Okay. And then on page, I'm trying to go quickly. My time is running out. On page six or slide six, I'm sorry, the guideline, the, the one through three guidelines. Um, I'm sure that this exists, but what schools currently are below the levels of efficiency? I know I have a... Uh, so I have that in the master plan. Okay. Maybe for the, the first reader, I'll... You would I'll, like it, yeah. I'll could reach we, out could to we submit, submit that to you as a, a follow-up? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Or we can refer them to the page number. Right. Yeah, that'd be great. I can do that. the charts. Okay. Okay, thank and you. And we apologize. We meant to have this out. It's a huge document, but we're still tweaking it, and we hope to have it out by Friday. And then okay. you'll have it. The public will have it. Okay. And then on slide 10, slide 10, um, so if I'm reading this correctly in comparison, I was looking at this on the way here on the train. So in comparison to slide 10 with slide eight and slide 11, am I correct in assuming that because there is a, high, a higher need, uh, based off the, the different colors on slide 10, there's a higher need for, I guess, renovation in the southern portion of the county, but there's also a drop in student enrollment in the southern portion of the county. Is that why uh, the MPSP's recommendations for consolidation tend to be located in the southern part of the county? because there is a high need for renovations, but also uh, dropping or slowly uh, dropping population in the in student enrollment? Um, it, it could be, and remember that we did change many of those recommendations because what they were looking for is to consolidate, and if you had to renovate, replace a school, make it larger. Okay. So there are a lot of schools across the county that are only 400 student schools. Yeah. So it, it, they looked at it as an opportunity. And we have revised some of those recommendations and the community can weigh in on them. And of course you can as well. Okay. And then on slide 11, just a clarification. So even with the projected growth in, say, let's say Fort Washington and Brandywine, still the, the southern third of the county is still going to be, if I heard you correctly, uh, those high schools will be underutilized even with that growth? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And a lot of those high schools are, let's say, 1,400 mm -hmm. students, and they really need to be maybe 1,000. Okay. If that. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. And that's it, Mr. Chairman. Now you're back. Sure. Thank you. Other questions? Why don't I jump in with mine, and then as, uh, uh, as we move forward, uh, we'll go. Uh, I think as a slight follow-up to what Mr. Wallace said, I want to go to slide 12. So I read slide 12 to be where we want to be as it relates to um, facilities utilization. I would love to see a slide more similar to this about um, the improvements that we're making in kind of the mission function work right because utilization seems like that's one piece of it this correct me if I'm wrong but this slide strictly represents uh, having the right number of students in each school right that's the versus story. the improvements we want to make which one what really excites me I should have said this from the beginning because I should just say this from the beginning you know I know I've only been doing this three years I don't know how long it's been but this is the this smartest and well thought out developed concept and data that I've seen by far this is really good stuff I should say that 
but when we, when we talk about how we want to not only improve the conditions of schools, but the function and mission part of it, I love to see like the where we are now and where we want to be with that as well as utilization. Uh, because I think, and this is where I think uh, Mr. Wallace was, was headed as well, is across the county, regardless of utilization, there are things we will be doing to improve the conditions of schools uh, that we really need to communicate with folks across the county that gets to the mission and function work, and we need to be really articulate about that. I just want to make sure that they note in their notes that really looks at the educational adequacy changes that were recommended as part of the master plan support project. If we were to get all the funding, what would that picture look like down the line in terms of what exists now, uh -huh. in terms of education specifications, and what it would look like if we got all the funding after the fact? Okay. That's what he's yeah, yeah, and that's accurate. That's accurate because the $8.5 billion is all inclusive of everything that makes a facility right. adequate for learning. Right. So but, we just got to figure out a yeah. way to display it. Yeah, I love the way to display it because we talked about the scores that folks got in the, in the mission assessment, something like 10 to 19 or right. something like that, right? I love to see a, 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 a graphic that says, okay. here's where we are today, and mm -hmm. here's where we want to be when okay. this process is done. So that it talks not just about utilization, but the other great work we're doing as well. Um, so what else I have? Um, and you talked well. We're sending out. We're sending out a kajillion email. I believe it. We're going to send an email a day. We're going to send robocalls and all that. But that's what we always do. What can we do? What? You know, I keep, you know, my first thought is, you know, hey, you know, let's spring to put a prime time, you know, uh, commercial on TV, and we might not be able to afford that. But what other thing, because to me, that, that, that very, when we go right to the very first slide about what we're trying to do, uh, that being transparent and listening support of the public is, I think, the, everything else we're doing is, I, I, our ideas and our recommendations are on point. That's the, as you guys know, it's the toughest part, and I'm just rambling a little bit here. And sometimes, no matter how well you do it, it's still going to be tough. But what other things are we thinking about to elicit support of the public, to get them involved, to get them on board, that kind of thing? Yeah, I think it's probably best if we go back and meet with the communications team that initially met with um, CIP to create mm -hmm. the three formal dates. Um, you're correct. We don't have the money to pay for a commercial, <laughs> but um, the on, very first it. thing that you I thought of was... give free on, uh, you know, prime time in the Super Bowl or something like that? No, <laughs> unfortunately, no. Maybe, maybe in the board's budget. <laughs> <laughs> but when you spoke about it, I thought we could videotape a, a similar presentation that kind of gives an overview of it and possibly send that out as part of an email link so that I think we need some non-traditional ways where people don't feel like they always have to attend a meeting. An example of that was the two new middle school sites where people had an opportunity to provide input, even though it was small. There were 25 people, though, that provided input about the location recommendations, and that could serve as another way of providing input in a non-traditional way. So I think right. it's just we could brainstorm and use the concept of the commercial without the cost of the commercial <laughs> and figuring out a way how to videotape that, publicize it for free. Way, I mean, because you know everybody's using social media now. I mean, we use, we have Twitter, we have uh, Facebook, and, and and whatever. Everyone but and us. And we try yeah. using that as well, you know, to try to push it out that way. As no, well. we hadn't tried a yeah. Facebook. Maybe one way to try to reach them. Yeah. Twitter. I'd like to see CIP do something in how many characters? Seventy-five characters. I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> Facebook. Yeah. We could try we, we Facebook. Them, <laughs> but that's a good idea. But so yeah. we'll okay. share that with our communications okay. team. Okay. All right, so la my, my last question. So when you go out and you're doing the public meetings, is it going to be some version of this presentation? It will be this presentation mm -hmm. that you see in this evening. And, um, and our plan is to have this same presentation presented at all three community meetings unless um, there is a change or an editorial, you know, recommendation. Right. Yes. All right, so I have a change in an editorial recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> 
Even we weren't going to say quite as much as we did for you. Yeah, I mean, the key is, as much as I, I mean, I deeply appreciate it, though we're, we're steeped in it, and it's already, like, my nose is barely above water as you're explaining this stuff to me, and this is my job, and I'm deeply steeped in it. So I guess what I, what I really want is for us to go out and communicate a message of caring and concern and love for the community, right? And to, uh, to tackle as delicately as we can, right? We know and understand the history of this county and the North, Middle, South dynamic. We're bringing you some data and some commitment and love to this community that we love them all and this is about taking care of all of our kids no matter where they live. That, to me, you know, after, you know, all of the data stuff is fine, but we need to figure out how to communicate that message. Uh, you know, with yeah, you, you, you know, you got to get up in the microphone and do some preaching to the people. You two can do it. I can believe it. You can get out there and do some good old Baptist preaching to the to, to the community. But I think that we really need to figure that out. I think that's an excellent point because when you do look at the actual document and see the data, it does come out. I mean, the graphics will show that there is uh, an enrollment or, or less enrollment in the southern part of the county than the northern. And anyone, even if they're not educational savvy, can look at that picture graph and see um, what exists. Now, it does to our advantage help because it shows that we're not making this information up. It is supported by external evaluators, but I think we also just need to be very sensitive about how it's delivered and send the message, this is not the Civil War, it's not the North against the South. And, and we, we, we are constantly tackling that issue, so we just need to be transparent in that delivery in those three presentations. And so I appreciate that recommendation. Right. And I, I think some of our board members can do some Baptist preaching for you if you, uh, if you need us to open it up. We really can. All right. Uh, Ms. Grady, Ms. Boston, and then we'll come back to Mr. Waller. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I know that one of their last meetings, too, I think um, you all asked, a, it was a small group, but like suggestions about communication. So I heard some of that, like just sort of sending the flyer through the principal so that they put it in the kids' book bag. Um, I normally get stuff like that. So I think that's also um, helpful. And I appreciate you all considering just the different options. I know the subscription. Um, I like it because recently we've been, I've been getting the subscriptions where it just summarizes whatever's going on and I'm just forwarding it to people. It's already nicely outlined in English and Spanish. So I don't think that was before. That's kind of, I've seen it happen the last couple of weeks and it's been really great. So, um, so I think that that's, and, and also it reoccurs. So it's not just happening one time, it's happening one, you know, a couple of days after you kind of get this email. So I think that's really awesome. So I think that the, the, I, it's going to be good to see what, what happens. Um, the, the difference of just trying the different communication um, angles of trying to reach people um, is great. Um, I know that the, the Facebook piece, um, and this is just sort of like some of our projects, they create them in their youth focused projects, but what have you, they do create momentum if that's sort of like, um, it's just for CIP or, or if it's just for events that the school will just be able to send out. I mean, that's just one way. But I do, thank you, and I do um, reiterate what, uh, well, sort of along the lines what Dr. Eubanks was saying, I think there's so much information and to take in and, um, so many pieces to this puzzle. And so always for me, is always, when I saw the facility needs summary, I, I'd smile because that's along the way, so I'm like, I just want to see something that has mm -hmm. the summary mm -hmm. um, and sort of like that cheat sheet, but um, also just being able to convey the work that, show, something that shows and demonstrate the work that has been done. Um, and I do have a question regarding when we do work, because we're in this situation where we have to sort of um, respond to the to to sort of fixing things as we go. Um, does that does that affect the schools then showing that they're actually they're more worse off than better? I can't. I'm not sure if that's clear. <laughs> so if I if I understand uh, your question, so 
the portfolio that, that shows 8.5 billion mm -hmm. is a portfolio of the work to be done to, maintain, to make the schools adequately, educationally sound, to meet utilization, enrollment, et cetera, et cetera. There's a piece of that 8.5 million that is a continuum piece to maintain, to keep the facilities up to par, to maintain them as you go along the life of those facilities. And that's built into the 8.5 million. If I, think what, if I think that's what the question is. So you have to spend money, capital dollars, to maintain some of these facilities as you, as you continue with the plan. It's and I think a lot of times that gets lost, um, that you know, there's multiple things kind of jug being juggled at one time. Mm -hmm. Sort of the, you have to respond like a Band-Aid to fix, to keep things going. Um, then sort of, you know, the summers, uh, you do a bigger Band-Aid or you sort of really look to what are some of the more immediate needs. And as then there's these other bigger plans that are, that there's some, you know, that are taking place. Because sometimes I think the discussions um, happen, but we also don't have a conversation about some of all the other work that's being done to maintain and to keep the schools running. Even when we talk about if there's no days, you know, um, what if it's, you have old schools, what what how does that impact? But um, but if 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 so, I just definitely wanted to thank you for the summary and just just keep, continue to keep in mind how to keep those cheat. I call them cheat sheets because somebody can at a glance kind of get the story of the work that's kind of taking place. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Boston. Ms. Grady asked one of my questions, but because uh, I, I pretty much wanted to know how we prioritizing um, some of these projects, and we know we have this big long list every year of our capital improvement, and, um, and are we looking at this master plan to kind of like prioritize these within the list that we already, existing list that we already have. And I, I wouldn't want to see some of the ones that's already on the list fall. Um, yeah. You this, know, because I. This is the driver now for that okay. list. Okay. The only thing that does alter that is what we end up getting in terms of state funding. Correct. And so we might have something listed for FY17, and there's just not enough state funding to cover. But that will be the only reason. So the old existing list that we had is mm -hmm. now replaced by the recommendations of the Master Plan Support Project, and that's what's driving those changes there. But, so, but so we, you, took, you, we took the list we had, to okay. your point, yes. and we adjusted it based on this information. Okay. But we didn't right. take those projects okay. you're talking about mm -hmm. and say, and just throw them all we're out. just replacing yeah, it they completely. Fall further. Right? They yeah. made recommendations that we do some things sooner than okay. you know, than we had maybe had it in our plan. Okay. So for example, the, we had talked about the two new middle schools, but it Correct. wasn't in our CIP where it, it is now. Correct. It's not as up. It, it moved further based on the recommendation from Bradford okay. and Dunleavy than what we initially had. Okay, and it knocked some other things kind of a little back a little bit, but hopefully within the... Well, the good thing is, is that this is just in the first part of the planning piece, okay. planning year, but the IAC is very supportive of the Master Plan Support sure. Project, mm -hmm. and because of that, I, th I firmly believe mm -hmm. that that's why it's been able to move through so fast. Okay. Right. They really appreciated that we came with the data. The, the year before this was done, when we sat before the IAC, first of all, they saw a very improved process in Prince George's County. And then they were told that we had this project underway and that next year's uh, IAC meeting would include recommendations that have been adjusted based on the results of that information. And so they've seen this process over three years, just as you have. And I think it's been very, very, very well received by the IAC. Okay, great. Okay. And one other question. Um, I think on one of them slides, I can't remember what the, what the slide number was, but we talked about middle schools, moving middle schools out of portables. What was the timetable for that? I mean, when, when are we starting and when is the projected end date on trying to get that? I know some of it is based on if we get new middle schools in, in the northern part, but, uh, but we're not building pretty much, or so recommending right. new schools in the, the central and, and the southern part, and they some of those schools do have portables. So you know, give me some idea on what we... So um, 
based on uh, earlier presentation, Beth mentioned that in the northern area of the county, there's a shortfall of, um, of mm -hmm. seats. In the current capital plan, to answer your previous question, what's prioritized, so we have two middle schools that are prioritized for 1,200 capacity apiece, that's 2,400 students would be in the next three years, 2019, 2020, those schools would be realized to house those 24 students, 2,400 students. Mm -hmm. We also talk about that's part of the plan. The other part of the comprehensive plan from the study is some schools would be getting additions based on after we do a balance approach, some schools would be getting ergonomically some additions to support the programs of need. Other schools would be um, doing, going through a comprehensive analysis so by virtue of the additions, new schools, and adjustments to schools, the temporary buildings that exist today, would, at some point in time, by attrition would go away when the plan is all said and done. So it's a, it's a continuum that progressively would change year after year after year after year based on the plan being implemented and, again, being fiscally, you get you know, funding to support the plan. So there's no fixed year to say by this date, all temporaries would go away. There's not such a fixed date. Right. No, yeah. we didn't. we've talked about it, but we don't have that yet. Okay, so there's really no, no time frame or timetable by which we're going to start implementing um, the, the, the removal of portables in a lot of our middle schools. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? That is true, okay. but, but let me add, because I do oversee the process for temp removal. Mm -hmm. Um, during the summer, mm -hmm. and this year we're not adding any additional temps. We are moving them from some sites and mm -hmm. moving, taking them away from some schools who mm -hmm. have decreased enrollment and who had temps, mm -hmm. and all those students now can fit in a building, and moving those to places where we have a capacity over 100%. Okay, thank you. Mr. Wallace. Uh, thank you. Just two more follow-ups to my, my first rant. On page 14, slide 14, um, under Longfields Elementary, there's a TBT. Uh, what needs to be determined for Longfields? Um, you'll see in the Educational Facility Master Plan that there are nine planning studies, mm -hmm. and when you receive the plan on Friday, hopefully, um, there's actually a list of all of the groupings of schools in each of the nine studies. So Longfields had a date, but it's very dependent on whether a school consolidates or not, then how big Longfields would be, right? Gotcha. Okay. And then the uh, second on page, slide 15, uh, under, I guess, nine planning studies, one of them being the educational program changes. You know, just give me a sense of what those changes would be. Are we, you know, are we removing science and tech from flowers no, and putting no, it to Largo? No. Or, you know? it, it's more like I had mentioned autism okay. and how, right, an autism program might take up a lot of classrooms in one school. And what we've noted is that some schools have 14 classrooms and others have like two. Okay. And so those might be the type of program changes that occur that changes the capacity enrollment of schools. Um, in addition, we always have new academic programs. And we're also looking at a number of other things too, like we're looking at the enrollment and completion uh, rates of our IB programs. You know, we've been trying to build them into feeders, but we've got five or six high schools where they exist, and some of them are having you know, quite frankly, diploma candidates, some of them aren't, and some of the enrollments are very small. So we're analyzing all that right now as we talk about efficiencies, as we talk about the Suitland um, uh, project, for example. They have a small, um, we used to, I guess, CTE, we used to call them Votech, you know, programs. It has a, a number of kids that we're talking about whether we should consult, you know, whether those, whether that program should be moved maybe to Crossland. I mean, yeah. those are the kinds of, when we talk about academic you know, changes. Some of those are just conversations we're having right now. We haven't really made final decisions, but those are the kinds of things that we're talking about and looking at. Uh, you know, where are our efficiencies? Do we really need to have this many, you know, programs of this type across the county? Absolutely, absolutely. And with those changes that you talked about, Dr. Maxwell, um, what is, I guess, if that's going to be uh, solidified, those changes, what is the timeline to inform those families and those students that may be enrolled in Suitland's Votech that may have to go to Crossland. Uh, I just don't want the when, same when, thing to happen at, at well, just hypothetically if that program would, would, would go to Crossland. 
I don't want the same thing to happen to Forestville High School students where they're just in the middle of the third quarter, they're told, okay, your schools or your program is going well, to be that, moved. That, that, com that conversation actually began a lot sooner I than know, that, I know. right? The, the, so, so, I mean, it's not fair to say they just got told this. That conversation was a public conversation for, for quite a, a, a number of months before uh, my letter went home. So just, just for clarity's sake, I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't want it. I don't want it to come across like we just made a decision last week and we made it the next week. There were lots of conversations for months that went on before a final decision uh, was made, and we go through that process every year, just like we went through these public meetings for the master plan support project before we brought it to you. Just like we've had and are continuing to have community meetings, and those kind of, that same kind of process will be followed. But I'm not going to promise you that it's going to be made two years in advance or anything typically you know we make that you know typically when we go through boundary changes and those kind of things we introduce that to you in the fall and we come to a vote in the winter sometimes it gets delayed a little bit sometimes some other you know changes happen but it's not typically more than a school year and mm -hmm. and then we make you know decisions now in the case of Siouxland you know we're we're gonna we're engaged we're getting ready to engage in a construction project and so there's a there's a time as we decide the ed specifications and there are people meeting about those ed specifications all already we'll make a decision as we do those ed specs whether we're including that or not because we'll need funding for it or not right and so as we have those conversations and make those decisions we'll be public about it as we bring documents to you that says here's the proposed project plan that'll be included in it or not included in it okay thank on you on that timeline thank you and I make that distinction because that's not the case necessarily if we're not doing construction at a school. But since we're doing a construction project at Suitland, it has to follow that timeline. But the rest of the time, typically those things come as boundary changes. These kids are being, you know, uh, they're, they're, the boundary for that is changing to this. All right, thank you. I don't see any more uh, questions for this evening. Okay, until, until I said that, and then everyone wants to just light, light up like crazy. Ms. Hernandez and then Ms. Williams. Thank you, good evening. Um, this question came about, so uh, on the topic of boundaries, well first off, I, I'd like to extend uh, my appreciation for extending the conversation on the new middle schools um, for more public comment, more public input. I think it's very important and certainly appreciate uh, that, that being continued. Um, I realize that the boundary planning studies were taken into account or into consideration as, as you guys are doing this work. Um, and the comment that I get often is I realize that new schools are propositions. I, I represent the Northwestern part, um, are being propositioned and they kind of want to know what it looks like, what the, the whole picture looks like in terms of them. What is this? What are these new schools going to mean to me and my community? Like, are they affecting me? Or is this just, you know, I live here, but, you know, at the end of the day, this doesn't matter to me. So I guess I want to know um, if there will be any opportunity to paint a more specific picture, I guess, with Mr. John Dell Jones's uh, shop uh, at any time. Actually, in the Educational Facilities Master Plan, there is a small chart that lists the three schools that, well, list the, oh, there it is. The schools that could potentially be impacted by the new middle schools. So the purpose of those, for example, let's just use the two new middle schools, is really to alleviate the overcrowding that currently exists in some of our northern middle schools. So that chart kind of helps to share what schools could potentially be impacted. Now, sure. the specific streets, we don't have, we're, we're not down to that level of detail. So right. a parent couldn't type in their address tomorrow and it say your child will go to the new middle school. That we wouldn't have, but at least you would know generally what schools could potentially be impacted by it. And, and I think the importance of that is that there's a, there's a fine line between making decisions here and saying here's what we're doing and hearing and, and getting input from the community, right? Sure. So, mm -hmm. so our goal with the new high school is to release overcrowding at those schools. But typically when we go out in those boundary conversations, John Dell, his team, whoever it is, right? The conversation is really, tell us what you think. You know, I mean, what, what makes sense? 
you know, does it make sense for this community or does it not make sense? And sometimes we end up with those difficult decisions like a community is going to end up being split one way or the other. So how's that work best? And try to get as much input as we can before we make a recommendation to you. It doesn't always make people happy, but sometimes you go into those conversations and somebody, you know, the people in the community make a recommendation. It's like, wow, that's a really great, you know, and so we, so we really want input in that part of it, but We've, we know that we need to relieve overcrowding at those three high schools. And so our goal right now as we build this school, the new high school and the new middle schools, is to relieve the situation there. That's a decision that, that we've made based on the information we have. But when we go to that next level, it's like, tell us okay. what you think. And we're, we still have to make a recommendation. That's our job. But we at least want to gather input first. But I do just want to make a reminder, there actually was a community meeting that you and Lupi were in where that actually took place. And it was a recommendation by a community that recommended that they go to, that that sixth grade go to Martin Luther King um, instead of remaining at their school. They, yep, a whole area, they just, they came to that realization, you know, our recommendation to resolve the overcrowding at Buck Lodge is for this set of kids, instead of going to Buck Lodge, to go to Martin Luther King. And that was part of the boundary recommendation that we presented this year. That came from community members. We hadn't come up with that. We hadn't thought of it. They did. And that was partly included. And I know it was a long time ago, because it was <laughs> December, and that seems like forever. But that came and, from those and meetings. We didn't do it because sure. Thank you. Miss mm -hmm. Williams. Good evening. And I apologize for being late. Um, and so my questions are just based on facilities questions in general and some um, process questions. The first comment is about um, communication. Um, if we could, I know we do a lot with reaching out to the communities, but um, from what I hear from my communities that are going through either a school build or a renovation or something, that the, the information isn't readily available. For example, Akakee Academy, which is going through the rebuild, the big question is always, when is it gonna be done? What's the holdup? And um, what has been told is that the principal is aware. My suggestion for the fix when I put my engineer's hat on is, can we put this information, either meeting notes or graphics or something, a schedule, um, so that parents can go to the website and easily find it on their own at any time without going to a meeting? Um, just making the inform information very transparent and available at 2 o'clock in the morning would, would be helpful to answer some of the questions. Just to put the timeline, if there is a delay and things like that, that would help to solve the problem as we go through this build in the north. Um, the other thing, through the communication and the process, it's the end result of the construction. Now, we're, we're promising or we're offering two new schools in the north that will accommodate 1,200 students. In the two cases that have just happened recently in the southern part of the county, what I'm told, and I haven't verified it, is that both Oxen Hill and Akakee Academy were built to levels that were less than what was promised in the beginning. And so if we're promising 1,200 seats, then we should either meet that or um, make sure that the community is very aware why we did not or if we're going to be able to expand. How are we going to now go from 1,200 and still meet the goals of reducing you know, uh, relieving the overcrowding in another school if we're not building 1,200 seats. So I think we have to be very clear about if we're saying we're gonna do 1,200 seats today, when it's built seven years from now, it needs to be 1,200 or at least 1,199. So I think we wanna do that. Um, so that was just a comment. My question is the long-term effect of the, the two schools in the north. One thing that I found in looking at population changes among schools that are adjacent to new schools built on new property is that those new schools built on new property seem to um, absorb or cannibalize the population of the other schools and then we end up reducing the population to the point where they are underutilized. For example, 
um, the Mattapanai situation. When I look at the population change or shift when um, Rosaryville was open, there was a big reduction in the number of students that were in adjacent schools. So when I look at the middle school number one and you're looking at Buck Lodge and Nicholas Orem, Buck Lodge is um, 185 students around about, I mean 1,085 and Nicholas Orem is about 862. So that's 1,800 students, and you're saying you're trying to reduce the population in those two schools. So if you were to take 1,000 students from those two schools, 500 apiece, those schools become underutilized. You see what I'm saying? So what is the long-term effect on the schools that you're trying to relieve the population from? In, the se in section five of the plan, it has all the details for every school in each of the planning areas, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a list alphabetically so that you can find them. And then the groupings should tell you the projected enrollments. And um, if you, when you get the plan and you go to table B, you'll see that there's a column for a post sixth grade realignment estimate. And so mm -hmm. there's a big difference in some of these areas when we move all of the sixth grade students to the middle schools. Now we have way too many, right, middle mm -hmm. school students. So if you're looking at the counts for the current middle schools and adding them up and wondering mm -hmm. how we're going to make all those students, many of those sixth graders are still in elementary schools, okay. and that's part of the problem. Right. We've been, we've been talking about in the north, for example, we have so much overcrowding mm -hmm. as opposed to in the southern part of, of the county that we can't do additional pre-kindergartens in a lot of play, all day mm -hmm. pre-kindergartens or even add half day pre-kindergartens because of space issues unless we put a portable in and some schools we don't even have the ability to, to do that because of the mm -hmm. property size, that we want to move the sixth grade into the middle schools mm -hmm. all across the district and we don't have the capacity. So part of that is reducing the overcrowding at Nicholas Orm and Buck Lodge, but part of that is taking the sixth grade from surrounding mm -hmm. elementary schools and going in. We just didn't get that all on one PowerPoint, but it's in the detail. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing with Oxon Hill, I mean, earlier this evening in, mm -hmm. in the you know, presentation, I think the right number is even after yeah. the, the work that we're doing with the, the current consolidation and the construction at Oxon Hill, those, we're still 2,800 high school students yeah. under capacity. Oops. Yeah. Right? Um, 2,800 after the Forestville consolidation. Right. And so, so the reason that the IC and the state, as the drivers in the funding process, mm -hmm. they won't let you oversize a school if you have available capacity nearby. Mm -hmm. That's part of the issue that mm -hmm. we're dealing with right now, mm -hmm. is that if you've got all these schools that are under enrolled, yet you want to modernize a school, you have to size it. And, you, and in order to do that, you have to take in the mm -hmm. capacity that's available elsewhere in your district because they expect you to redistrict before you spend money. Mm -hmm. That's essentially, you know, what happens. So, so Oxon Hill, and I think the community was aware of that when at the time, yes. maybe they've forgotten or maybe they're different <laughs> people, whoever is, is talking. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think I wasn't here, but I understand from people who were here yeah, yeah. is that they mm -hmm. knew it was reduced to 1,200. Right. And but so I think the key is mm -hmm. they did know, but it takes five to six years for a building to be built. So the folks that mm -hmm. knew were, were gone. not the people that were there anymore. And so new, so then the students come in and they think, and their parents think that this is new information, and you still have mm -hmm. people who are out saying we really need a school that's the same size. We knew the minute that the contractor went to that site we knew that that school what mm -hmm. that enrollment of that school was going to be and unfortunately um each year they waited until the very last minute mm -hmm. to make that boundary change and so th that sort of goes back to the communication piece is to keep it you know they use the kiss concept keep it simple stupid <laughs> and if we keep it keep that information on the website we can you know be able to refer back to say, this is the timeline, we informed you, this isn't anything new. And so that's sort of what has resulted. I mean, these kids, because it takes a long time to build a school, these kids were probably in first or second grade, or, or I would say fourth or fifth grade, 
um, by the time they get to Oxen Hill, and then they, they're like, oh, this is much smaller than we anticipated, you know, I can't get my child in, and things like that. So just one final comment um, on, on the, I had a note on boundaries. Just communication on boundaries is very important, you know, always in my district, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we talked a lot about communications today, and uh, that'll, that'll be noted. All right. So now we are done with comments. Uh, so I'm going to say two things as we're wrapping up. Uh, the first, Ms. Wilson, let me uh, state explicitly uh, for the minutes uh, that I wanted to reflect my disappointment about board attendance this evening. Um, we know that... Um, Sessions like this are designed for us to be steeped in very complex and complicated data and information in order to inform the wise decisions that we make. So it's disappointing to me that had we needed to conduct business tonight, we wouldn't have quorum to do so. Uh, so for that, I will ask, also ask Ms. Berry that as soon as the recording is available for this meeting, I would ask please to send it to the board and reminding particularly those board members uh, who did not attend today's session, how important it is for them to review this presentation and to review this background and material before this hits first reader so that when we have to talk about this come second reader, we're all equally knowledgeable about all of the details about this. Um, uh, and I will also note to folks again, so Friday is the day so I would ask that, that when Friday comes, I was going to say if, but when Friday comes and it is today, to please send an email to the board with a link uh, immediately saying it's on board, here it is, happy reading, read every single one of these 1,700 pages. I request that it goes directly to Ms. Um, Berry, Erica yeah, Berry. So Erica go, Berry. That's fine, and then Ms. Berry can forward it to the board. All right, and with that, we are adjourned. Thank you very much, folks. Have a great evening. Thank you.